Well, Merry Christmas. Hey, that's some good enthusiasm, guys. Well done. Well done. Not bad for a 9 a.m. service. Uh, hey, uh, my name is Josh Crane. I'm the lead pastor here. We've been wrestling with this question the last several weeks, and it kind of boils down to this. Who is Christmas for? Right uh, Around this time, it's the day before Christmas. Some of you are completely worn out from Christmas shopping. Some of you should be more worn out than you are because you did not do enough and you are nervous. I, uh, I called my brother actually early this morning. He lives in Colorado. And I just told him, hey, uh, we're going to start a new annual tradition. Uh, my wife and I got you and uh, your wife uh, New Year's gifts this year instead of Christmas gifts because we <laughs> ordered way too late. So, so, so some of us feel pretty tired. And this season can lose some of its magic when we feel that way. So who is Christmas for? Who is it for? Like, is it for us or is it really just for the kids? It's like, who is Christmas for? Because the reality is most things aren't for everyone. In fact, uh, I was looking for some very specialty gifts this last week uh, just to see if I could find something that might not be for everyone. You ever had this problem where you're eating a burger? And by the way, I want to apologize in advance. In-N-Out did not deliver this early in the morning, but Jack in the Box did. So what I'm about to do is self-sacrificial for you, okay? You ever, <laughs> you ever been eating a burger? And it turns out you're just so bad at eating a burger, like you just keep getting it all over yourself, right? And you're like, man, this is a real problem. Some of you are pointing to your spouses. You don't have to do that, okay? Um, but good luck for you because for the very, very low price of only $9.95, you buy a burger holder and you just, you just put it right in there and then you can just walk around and you don't have to worry about ketchup or mustard or mayonnaise getting on you and you just eat bites. <laughs> I said no mayonnaise. They, they did not listen. Okay, so, um, so that's a gift that's probably not for everyone. Uh, I also found, and this is, this is real, if you've ever wanted a banana, but you're like, it's just too much hassle, you know, slicing a banana up, they actually make a banana slicer, $5.99. <laughs> this thing will change your life, too. Like, the reviews on Amazon for this amazing piece of work uh, are just fantastic. I'm going to share one with you, actually. So, um, one person said, for decades, I've been trying to come up with an ideal way to slice a banana. Use a knife, they say. Well, my parole officer won't allow me to be around knives. <laughs> Shoot it with a gun, they say. Background checks, hello. I had to resort to carefully attempt to slice those bananas with my bare hands. 99% of the time, I would get so frustrated that I just ended up squishing the fruit in my hands and throwing it against the wall in anger. Then after a fit of banana-induced rage, my parole officer introduced me to this kitchen marvel, and my life was changed. No longer consumed by seething anger and animosity towards thick skin, yellow fruit, I was able to concentrate on my love of theater and am writing a musical play. This thing changes lives, changes the world, okay? For such a low price, you should probably grab one, but it's, not, it's probably not for everyone. Or are you the kind of person who, um, oh yes, yeah, some people, by the way, couldn't figure out how to use it on Amazon, so we had to... Throw that on there too. Maybe you're the kind of person, by the way, that loves squirrels. I mean, that's weird, but maybe that's who you are, okay? And you just, you love squirrel feeders. Maybe you're also the kind of person that loves cats, and you would love to put these two things together. Well, man, have I got a gift for you. There is a, it's a, it's a cat head squirrel feeder. You put a rope in it, and then you put the food up here in the front of the face, and the squirrel goes up there to eat the food, and then it looks like he's wearing a cat head. People online have done amazing things with this particular <laughs> item. <laughs> there's also, the other thing I loved, there's this, you know, there's this Amazon feature where you'll be looking at an item and underneath it will be like, hey, discover similar items. Here's some things that are kind of like the thing that you're looking at, right? And it brought, as I was looking at this cat head squirrel feeder, it said, maybe you'd be interested in this. Guys, if I want this. This is not cutting it, okay? Like, this is just a regular old squirrel feeder. I, I might could do if you suggested something better, like a, a gnome head cat feeder. That might be interesting to me. Or perhaps the creepiest thing I've ever seen, a unicorn head squirrel feeder like that. <laughs> that would be fine, but not this. This is just this is not going to cut it. And finally, uh, the last gift. It's not for everybody, but m maybe, maybe it's for you. It's for the person that has everything. And you see one more thing. Uh, hander pants is the name of this. Um, <laughs> These are gloves that look like underwear. And in fact, uh, they're of such high quality. I've already ripped both of them, uh, just trying to put them on in other services. So uh, you're just gonna have to imagine what they would look like on my own hand. So they look a lot like this. What I really love is in the back of the box, it tells you there's a bunch of great uses for them, right? You can keep your gloves fresh, sanitary handshakes, girly stuff, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, construction, uh, cooking, cruising, the elderly is just a use for these, just the elderly, you know. But my favorite is the last one, <laughs> night blogging. <laughs> Like, 
Like, yeah, in your underwear, night blogging in your hand underwear. So that's, that's that. I also think probably John Cena could use it, you know, you can't see me, that kind of thing. But um, most things, most things aren't for everyone. But Christmas actually purports to be, that it would be for everyone. And so I want to talk this morning for a few minutes about Christmas and kind of the two approaches that pastors would usually use on a Christmas Eve service like this is to talk about either the Christmas story in great detail and to dive into maybe a piece of that. And we've done that here before, or to maybe talk about the meaning of the story. And we're going to focus more on the meaning of the story this morning than on the specific details of the Christmas story. Probably most of you are at least somewhat familiar with the Christmas story. And so just to give you like a real quick overview, if you're, if you're kind of new to it, uh, we, Christians believe, followers of Jesus believe, that uh, God loved us so much that he wanted to make sure that the gulf that existed between us and him, and this gulf existed because of our own brokenness, our own sin, our propensity to uh, inflict pain on other pr- people, our propensity to make a mess of things. That kind of broke off relationship with us. It removed us from our life source, who was our creator. And so God loves us so much, he, he wanted to fix that rift. And so he sends Jesus Christ, his son, to take on human flesh and blood and to live the kind of life that we should live and to show us what it looks like to, to follow after God. And then uh, he uh, takes all the sin and the death and the darkness of the world upon his shoulders and he allows it to kill him as he's crucified on a cross by the Roman Empire. And three days later, he destroys all that stuff uh, by, by raising from the dead. When he resurrects, he destroys all the evil, the darkness, the death of the world, and, and he does away with it. And for those then who want to follow after him, you can have right relationship with God again. That's just kind of the two-minute version of the gospel. And, and so it's Christmas time. What we celebrate is what's called the incarnation, the actual arrival of God himself in flesh, in a manger, in the city of Bethlehem. And for lots of you, you have nativity scenes or some versions of that in your home where you see them out and about. And it's Jesus and his parents, Mary and Joseph, and the, the, the wise men and the, and the shepherds. And the wise men weren't actually there. We talked about this last week, not to burst your bubble, but, uh, but, but, but they all came within the first you know, couple of years of Jesus' life to see what God was up to in Bethlehem. But that's that's not what I want to focus on this morning. I actually want to focus on the meaning of that. So, so there's the story. What do we do with the story? What's the meaning of the story? So there's a passage in the book of, of 1 John. John was one of the uh, first followers, one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. And he writes this about what they had seen, right? And he's writing to people, by the way, who were his contemporaries, who would have been alive when Jesus was alive. So he's not writing to people like saying, trust me. He's writing to people, some of whom would have been there with him, would have seen what he saw. And he writes this. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. That's Jesus. He's, he's, he's always existed, in other words. But whom we have heard and seen. Like Jesus has always existed. There's an there's a understanding of Christ that he's cosmically existed. But, but then he came in the manger. That's the miracle of Christmas. In flesh and blood so that we could actually hear him and see him. We saw him with our own eyes. And we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. And this one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him now, and now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. That's who he is. It's not just something he points to. That's who he is. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. And we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship, right, our relationship, this is relationship that we have, is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus did, we can now have relationship, fellowship with the Father. Uh, we are writing these things so that you may, you may fully share our joy. And the question is, is this for you or is this just for a select few? Is this for everybody or is Christmas just for a handful? So I want to talk about three large buckets this morning of people who I think are probably representative of pretty much everyone in the room and watching online. And uh, they look like this. I want to talk about those of you who are joyful. I want to talk about those of you who are exhausted. And I want to talk about those of you who are skeptical. And probably you can put yourself in one or more of these buckets. And I just want to talk about what Christmas means for those of you who are joyful, those of you who are exhausted, and those of you who are skeptical. We're going to start with uh, joyful because some of you, you are just joyful. I, I can, you know, uh, every, every Sunday morning, it's a little secret I'll give you. Every Sunday morning, any communicator up here is going to look for a few people in the audience that we call home base face. These are people who just kind of look smiley and delightful. Their eyebrows are often up and they're clearly paying attention. And there's a few of you, I haven't told you this, and I'm not going to pick out who you are and, and make you like on the spot feel bad. There's a few of you who every Sunday when you're here, it's very helpful for me because you have a home base face. You just, you're, you're looking lovely, like you're engaged, like you're enthralled. And there's a few of you I just pass over and I just never look at you because it doesn't do anything... <laughs> But discourage me. So, so, so some, of you, <laughs> some of you have just this like joyful demeanor about you. And you may have noticed 
Uh, it's increasingly unpopular to be joyful in the world. Like if you're not angry, right? I, I, hear, I hear this kind of phrase a lot of times. Like if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. There's so much to be mad about. There's so much to be fearful about. There's so much to be defensive about. And in fact, uh, let's just name it. Let's be honest. If we had to say like, hey, what has the church in the United States been really known for the last five or six years? I don't think joy would be on most people's like top five words that come to mind, right? I think lots of Christians and frankly, lots of pastors, and I'm, I'm disappointed in the pastors because, you know, spiritual leaders in the church help set the temperature of the church. And lots of pastors have just kind of this, this demeanor of this, you know, a spittle flecked, rah, like just angry about everything. And they've led people to believe, Christians, well-meaning Christians to believe that what you actually are is a persecuted and religious minority that needs to fight for your rights and be angry and defensive all the time. And you just need to go out and charge the hill and get them. Like that, that's kind of the mindset. But, but that wasn't the way that Jesus approached anything. Jesus led this group of people and even though he was eventually killed by the Roman Empire, he didn't preach against the Roman Empire. Jesus told us time and time again that actually your problem is not the Romans. Your problem is not other people. Your problem is not flesh and blood. Your problem is a spiritual captivity that you have to a darkness within your heart. And I am here to fix that. And if you don't fix that, nothing else matters. That's the miracle of Christmas. And so then when Jesus comes, it inaugurates this new period where, where because he is here, he is the first sign that God is working to renew and restore and reconcile all things. Like all the pain, the darkness in the world, the times that you've been hurt, the injustice that we see, like God does not want that for the world. He does not want that for you. And so he's working to renew and restore and reconcile all things. Things. And Jesus points to that repeatedly. And when you know that that's the direction that you're moving in, then you get to be a part of God's restoration project, as opposed to always like keeping score as to whether we are winning or whether we are losing, right? Uh, back in January of, of this year, so this last NBA season, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big basketball fan. I love the Lakers. Uh, and some of you who know Jesus well, you love the Lakers too. So... <laughs> Uh, the Lakers were playing the Dallas Mavericks. They'd already lost to them, I think, two or three times uh, that season. Uh, one of the games, Luka Doncic, he's the Dallas Maverick here on the right, uh, had hit a three-pointer to take the Mavs into overtime, and then hit a three-pointer to send them into double overtime, and then the Mavericks had, had won uh, and, and beat the Lakers. I was actually at that game with my son, Jack, and it was an amazing game. I mean, it was an amazing game. But when the Lakers lost at the end, uh, I look over, my son, Jack, he's 10. He was in tears. He was crying. And I was like, Jack, it's okay. And he goes, I know, Dad, but LeBron's just so old, and he just doesn't have many years left, and I just want him to win. And I just <laughs> I was like, whoa. Okay. First of all, he's younger than your father. Um, <laughs> yeah. Say, sh shed a little tear for me, son. So, so this game happened a little bit later in the season after they'd already lost in heartbreaking fashion a couple times. Second quarter of this game, uh, they're down 27 points to the Mavericks. No, I had recorded this game. I wasn't able to watch it live, so I was watching it uh, back that night. And unfortunately, or fortunately in this case, I had accidentally seen the score of the game right before I started. I, I pulled up the ESPN.com page to just see what other scores in the league were. And it's supposed to set up so that it doesn't show me Lakers scores, but it did. It's fine. It's like, you know, Jack in the Box and mayonnaise. It's, it doesn't always go well. Um, and so I pulled it. I actually saw the score, and I saw that the Lakers won 111 to 108. That was going to be the final score. And so then as I'm watching the game, like the, the recording of the game, we get into the second quarter, and they're down like 10 points, and they're going to have 15 points and then they're down 20 points, and they're down 27 points. And at that point, I'm like, I know they're going to win. I'd be happy if they went down by 40, because the more they go down, the more brilliant the ending is going to be. And sure enough, like LeBron just goes on a tear, and, and they just come back, and they defeat the Mavericks. But I wasn't stressed out. I wasn't angry. I wasn't There's a lot of times when I'm watching games, and I am not calm, okay? But that particular day, I was just enjoying it. Why? Because getting behind is less demoralizing when you know the outcome. Followers of Jesus, reminder, God is working to renew and restore and reconcile all things, and he will. It's not about winning and losing. It's about God setting all things right. And if you're a follower of Jesus, this Christmas season should be a reminder that you get to be a part of the restoration project. And we don't have to be angry and stressed out and fearful and defensive because we know the outcome. So whatever comes, bring it. And we want to be a part of God's kingdom, bursting forth in a new way in the midst of an old world. This is what, uh, just a reminder that 1 John said at the end of verse 2 there in chapter 1. 
And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. This is this Jesus is eternal life. Later on in this book, he says that God is love. God is eternal life. God is love. Jesus is eternal life. Jesus is love. This is, by the way, one of the major markers of Christianity. It's one of the things that makes it different from every other religious tradition in the world. Every other religious tradition in the world usually has a prophet or a sage that points to whatever the end goal of that religion is. Maybe it's some version of heaven. Maybe it's enlightenment. Maybe it's becoming one with the universe. Whatever it is, there is a prophet or sage that points to it. The Christian tradition is so different because it's, Jesus doesn't point to the life, doesn't point to love. Jesus is life. Jesus is love. It's a major difference of Christianity. And so what Christmas means then is that the birth of this person who is fully God and now fully human so they can dwell amongst us, fully life, fully love, and that's what we're celebrating at Christmas time, which means that if you're joyful and your friends are like, why are you in such a good mood? Don't you know that everything's terrible all the time? If you're joyful, good. Christmas means your joy is justified. That's what Christmas means. So some of you aren't feeling joyful. Some of you are feeling exhausted. There's different kinds of ways to feel exhausted. Some of you are feeling exhausted in body, like you're just physically tired. You wake up feeling exhausted. Uh, some of you, you, you have kids and uh, you, you, you love your kids. Maybe they're young kids. Maybe you just had a new baby. And in your mind, your relationship with your children was going to basically look like this every day. Wake up and lots of loving and, you know, Eskimo kisses and that kind of thing. But life's looked a lot more like this. And it's just like... I. I I don't know what to do with that. Like, I feel exhausted and tired all the time. Some of you are just like, you're on the treadmill of life. You're just going all the time. You're not sleeping. You're burning the midnight oil. Like, some of you are just like, just bodily, you are exhausted. And you're walking into the Christmas season feeling exhausted. It's not that you're against joy. It's just like really hard to find it in the exhausted moment that you're sitting in right now. Some of you, it's not a body exhaustion. It's like, it's a heart exhaustion. Some of you lost a loved one in the last 12 months, and tomorrow is your very first Christmas without them. And most years, the Christmas music that you hear in the department stores and Target on the radio, like it, it kind of gives you a pep in your step, and it's a beautiful, lovely time of year. But this year, every time you've heard a song, it's just been a reminder that this year's gonna feel way different than the other years have felt. There's just, there's just a heart pain that you're sitting with, there's a part of you that's grateful for the season, maybe, but there's a part of you that's frankly dreading just trying to white knuckle and get through tomorrow. Some of you, you trusted someone with your heart, maybe it was a really good friend or a family member or a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or someone at work even, like you told them something or you gave them something or you had this long relationship with them. And in the last number of months, like, like your heart has been broken by the way that that relationship has gone. And it feels to you like, like you, you handed them your heart, you trusted them with it, and they were not careful with it. And so you're walking into Christmas just like my, your heart's just worn out and you're not feeling like nearly as merry and bright this time of year as you wish you were. Some of you, it's, it's not oh, body exhaustion. It's not a heart exhaustion. It's like a mental exhaustion, a mind exhaustion. Maybe like... <laughs> Maybe you've had uh, debt and stress about finances. Now you're in the Christmas season. You're supposed to buy Christmas presents for everybody, and that's just one more thing. You're like, I don't know how I'm ever going to dig my way out of this. Maybe you're uh, in a job that requires a lot of mental focus and concentration. You're thinking about, like, how are we going to end Q1 well, and how are we going to hit our KPIs, and, like, what are we going to do to push this forward? And, like, there's just a whole lot on your plate, and you're just thinking about it all the time. You're constantly problem solving. Or maybe there's a relational issue in your life. Things went sideways with you and your brother or sister or spouse or parents or children. And, and you're like, every time you talk to one another, there's the tension of the thing that's unresolved sitting in the room between you. And neither one of you have figured out how to solve. Maybe you're not even talking anymore. And so you, sometimes your, your day, like you're going through it and you're not thinking about it that much. And then the, the fresh pain of that tension enters back into your mind and your heart and, you're, and now you're trying to problem solve again. What if I said this? What if we talked about this? Like, do you think I, maybe if I apologize for that, like, like you, but you can't, you can't quite solve it. So the, whatever it is that's in your mind, like it's just, it's just sitting there a lot and you're having a hard time with it. That's for some of you, there's just like a mental exhaustion. For those of you who find yourself that in that spot, there's this place where it can feel really lonely. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted in body or heart or mind. And like, I'm just, I feel like I'm alone and I'm sitting in it by myself. And the reminder then of Christmas is 1 John 1 uh, verse 4. And he says, in our fellowship, our relationship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. That what Christmas means is that it inaugurated an ability for you to have a close relationship with God that you didn't have before. Christmas 
means that you are not alone. And even when it feels like there's no one with you, God is with you and he is for you. Maybe you're not joyful, you're not exhausted, maybe you're skeptical. Uh, maybe you're just not sure what you think about Jesus or about Christianity or about maybe any kind of faith at all. Maybe you're here today and it's the first time you've been in church in a really long time or someone told you, they promised you they would take you to Christmas Eve breakfast if you would come this morning or you're just really young and your parents told you we're going, I'm the mom, I'm the dad, like that's happening. Maybe you're just miserable right now and you really wish this guy would shut up. I got about three more minutes. Um, and so, so <laughs> whatever, whatever your reason is for being here, I just want you to know like I, I'm grateful that you are but I understand if like, you're not sure what you think about this. Faith, by the way, just, like, just cards on the table. Faith has never come easy for me. I am a skeptic. I'm a skeptical person by nature. Faith's never come easy for me. But if, if you're walking away from something, if you're like, I don't believe the Jesus story, I don't believe the faith story, that's just not my thing. If you're walking away from that, you are walking towards something else, and you need to know what the thing is you're walking toward. Because if you don't believe that the, the, the origin of this universe is from a loving God who wanted to have a relationship with you, that means that you're going to think that the origin of this universe was something else. Now, listen, we're all for science here at the Verve City Church, like, like, like big time, right? You know, lots of us uh, believe that God created everything out of love, but that he did th so through an evolutionary process over billions of years. Like that, that is totally compatible with a Jesus-focused faith. But we do believe that God was highly engaged and involved in the process. But if, if you don't believe that, then what you're walking toward is a pure form of naturalism that really like everything just started by accident or by reasons that we can't understand and that everything's just a natural process. There's nothing behind it except, you know, the movement of atoms and chemicals and gases throughout the universe and that's it. And so, uh, you know, a, a scientist by the name of Francis Crick a number of years ago said this and he actually, uh, this is true. If, if everything's just purely naturalistic, this is true, but it may not feel great. You, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. In other words, that feeling that you have that like you love someone or that they love you, those are just chemicals and neurons and like they really, they're, they're really kind of meaningless. Like they don't, they don't matter. In fact, uh, the New York Times ran an article talking about the scientific view of this a number of years ago. And one of the commentators uh, at the bottom of the article, actually, I thought summed the article up pretty well. And this is what they said. There are 30,000 galaxies that are over 30 billion years old with many trillions of stars and many, many more trillions of inferred planets. So how significant are you? You're not a unique snowflake. You're not special. You are just another piece of decaying matter on the compost pile of this world. Nothing of who you are and what you will do in the short time you are here will matter. Everything short of that realization is vanity. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I added the last part. Look, if you're walking away from belief that there's a loving God like behind all of this, then what you're walking toward is this version of naturalism. Like that is the natural place that that's going to lead you. And then you've got this question, like, does anything matter? You know, Friedrich Nietzsche basically said, he's a very famous philosopher and an atheist, and he basically said, like, any, anything that we believe of morality, any, that, anything that we believe of justice, that's really just leftovers from a faith that no longer matters. If everything is just pure Darwinianism, pure naturalism, then, then it's every person for themselves and nothing else really matters. Now, that may be true. Maybe that's true. But if you're a skeptic, even if you're skeptical about the Jesus thing, here, here's what I know about you. While that purely naturalistic thing may be true, I'm guessing that you hope not. You hope there's more to it than that. In fact, Steve Jobs uh, years ago, before he passed away, was interviewed by Walter Isaacson uh, for a book that he wrote, a biography that he wrote on him. And there's this really interesting section of the book where Jobs is thinking about, he's very sick at the time, he's thinking about his mortality. And this, this is what he says. He says, I'm about 50-50 on believing in God. For most of my life, I felt that there must be more to our existence than meets the eye. And then this is Isaacson talking. He said, he admitted that as he faced death, he might be overestimating the odds out of a desire to believe in an afterlife. Job said, I like to think that something survives after you die. It's strange to think that you accumulate all this experience, maybe a little wisdom, and it just goes away. So I really want to believe that something survives and maybe our consciousness endures. He fell silent for a very long time. But on the other hand, perhaps it's like an on-off switch, he said. Click, and you're gone. Then he paused again and smiled slightly. Maybe that's why I never liked to put on-off switches on Apple devices. <laughs> 
Jobs had, and I think most of us have, this, there, there's a longing within us for something that we're not sure exists. Like the love that we experience, that we give, and that we receive in this life, like we want it to endure even after our mortal bodies pass away. Why is that? Like especially if it's just like an on-off click switch. Like what, why do we long for that? C.S. Lewis said this years ago. If we find ourselves with the desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. So maybe you're skeptical. And maybe it's like, I'm not sure I believe in any of this. I'm like, okay. But like it's, maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe it's all just a big cosmic accident and none of this matters. But maybe, maybe we're created by a loving God and all of it matters to the world. What would that look like? Dorothy Sayers was an author in the 20th century. She wrote a series of detective novels uh, about Lord Peter Whimsey, which is maybe one of the greatest detective names of all, Lord Peter Whimsey. I just really, really like it. He was kind of a Sherlock Holmes type figure, right? And so a number of detective novels. And in the books, he's, he's a bit standoffish. He's a bit of a hermit. Uh, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't hang out with lots of people. He doesn't have a, a vibrant dating life. And... Uh, Dorothy Sayers' biographers believe that as she's writing about Lord Peter Whimsey, she wrote a number of books, I think about 15 books about him, at some point she kind of fell in love with this character that she created. And toward the end of the series, there is a new character that's introduced into the Lord Peter Whimsey novels uh, named Harriet Vane. And Harriet is not a beautiful woman. She's kind of bookish. She's, she, she's a writer. And she ends up helping uh, Lord Peter Whimsey solve a number of crimes. And eventually they end up falling in love and getting married in the book series. And most of Dorothy Sayers' biographers believe that she fell so in love with Lord Peter Whimsey, her, her creation, that she wrote herself into the story so that he could be with her forever. This is essentially what we celebrate at Christmas time. That God loved us so much, his creations, that he wrote himself into the story so that he could be with us forever. That's what we celebrate when we celebrate Christmas. That's the miracle of what Jesus did Dorothy Sayers, in reflecting upon Jesus, she said this, he himself has gone through the whole of human experience from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. He was born in poverty and suffered infinite pain all for us, and he thought it well worth his while. See, if you're feeling skeptical, perhaps you're right, and the universe is just one big cosmic accident, and all the love that we've ever felt is just a chemical response to input. Maybe that's true. But I'll bet you hope it's not. And Christmas uh, tells us that the creature, that the, the creator became a creature. He became like one of us, one of his creations. That's what he chose to do. And that Christmas means that love really matters. It's not just a chemical reaction. So... Uh, take a look. Joyful, exhausted, skeptical. I don't know where you are this Christmas season, but I invite you to take just a few moments and find yourself. Which word describes you as you walked in here this Christmas Eve morning? The question we started with is, who is Christmas for? I was listening uh, a a couple months ago to a comedian named Pete Holmes on Netflix. Uh, he had a very funny comedy special. It is not rated G. If you see it and you're offended by it, I did not recommend it. But I was watching, um, I was watching Pete Holmes, and at one point he's doing a bit, and in the midst of the bit, it's almost like he gets sidetracked, and he just says, you ever get home from a party and you just throw your keys on the table and you think to yourself, ha, I am not for everyone. <laughs> And I just thought that was very funny because I've learned a few things in my lifetime. And one of the things I've learned is that I am not for everyone. Not everybody enjoys me. Sometimes I'm a bit much for people and I've kind of learned that as I got older. So I was telling my wife, by the way, everybody loves my wife, Emily, and she's never met anyone in her life who did, wasn't just thrilled to be in her presence. She's an amazing woman. And so I was telling her about the Pete Holmes thing and I was like, yeah, and then he threw his keys on the table and said, I am not for everyone. And I laughed really hard and she didn't laugh because she didn't get it because that's not her experience of the world. She's for everyone, Okay. <laughs> 
And I was trying to explain to her, no, 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 like, you know, like, I'm not for everyone. And I, I, was, I was telling this story, I, I remembered, it's, I hadn't thought of it in over 20 years, but it came into my mind as we were having this conversation that when I was 18 or 19 years old, I went with a couple of friends, and they were a couple years older than me, so they had been to college, and we all met in the, for a big concert in Dallas, Texas, and they brought a couple of people I'd never met before, friends that they had made at college, and uh, they were, we were all hanging out, and one of their friends walked away at some point, I was like, oh, where did that guy go? And my friend Josh Carnes, one, one of my best friends in the world, he looked at me very kindly, he just said, um... He just doesn't like you very much. And I was like, what? It was the first time I ever thought that someone might not like me. And I was like, well, why, why doesn't he like me? And he's like, I don't know. He just, he needed some space. I think he just thinks you're a lot. You're a lot. I was a lot. So, um, <laughs> so, I, I was trying to, so that made me think to call my friend Josh. And I was like, hey, do you remember this thing? Because I thought of him in a long time. He's like, oh my goodness, yeah. Uh, the guy's name was Jason Potts. And since this is broadcast online, I just want to say, Jason, hope your life's going great, man. Um, so... Uh, but, but, but Jason was, 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 was not a fan, apparently. And I was like, do you remember the reasons? And Josh said, like, no, I haven't talked to him in years. I can call him if you want me to. I was like, please don't call Jason and tell him someone who he didn't like 22 years ago was asking about him. That's going to be so weird. <laughs> I am not for everybody. I know that. Most of you are not for everybody. There's things about your personality, they just don't like. And that's not your fault. I mean, some of, it, 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 some of you, it is your fault. We wish you would act differently. <laughs> but most of you, it's not your fault. Not many things are for everybody. Who is Christmas for? Whether you're joyful or exhausted or skeptical, whether you're sad or happy, whether you have a ton of faith or faith is difficult for you, Christmas is for you because Christmas is for everyone. And my hope for you this Christmas season is that you would see in Jesus, the loving creator of the world, who so longed to have fellowship with you, that he wrote himself into the story so that you would never again have to be alone. And if that's compelling to you, my hope is that this Christmas season, you would do well to pray to God, like, hey, God, I'm not even sure that you're there. But if you are, can you show me the ways that you've written yourself into my life? That's one way to have a very Merry Christmas. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time together this morning. God, we are so grateful for Jesus. We're so grateful for this Christmas story. And not just for the details of it, which are fascinating and helpful, but Lord, also for the meaning of it. And I pray, God, that uh, you would just help this story become alive to us and that the meaning of it would have direct application to our life as well. We're grateful for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.